of Sophie Jackson to tell us why are there knots in proteins. So Sophie will speak for about 20 minutes or so, then there'll be a question time, and she'll continue speaking, and we'll have some more questions at the end. So Sophie, take it away. <laughs> thank you very much, David. Um, thank you, and uh, to, to Jose as well for um, uh, inviting me to give a, a talk. And um, I have to say I am uh, quite new to this uh, kind of um, mode, so, uh, but I'm sure it'll all be fine. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about why are there knots in proteins. And I am aware that within the audience are almost certainly some mathematicians, um, possibly some physicists, and probably relatively few chemists or biochemists. So I thought I would start by uh, just going over some very basic material. Oh, here is the structure of my talk. So I'll give you a very quick introduction to protein structure, and then I'll talk you through the, the history of, of knots in proteins. Then we'll have a break. And then um, I'll just say a little bit about theories on why knots in proteins have been conserved. And then the main part of the talk will, will, will be part four, which is going through some of the experimental and computational evidence uh, for a number of those theories. And then I'll just end up, um, of course, with some conclusions and acknowledgments. Okay, so a very quick introduction to protein structure. So on this slide, you see the uh, molecular structure of, of a protein shown at the top, in which you can, uh, so proteins just linear polymers of amino acid building blocks, and uh, they uh, form the polymer through the making a peptide bond, and uh, that peptide bond is the same for each uh, amino acid group, and it forms what we call the backbone of the protein, and that is just shown by the colored blocks. Uh, and then you will see that um, for every amino acid, for every peptide bond, each has what we call a side chain. Uh, they can have a number of different sizes and chemical um, properties. Um, and um, I'm showing you this. So this just actually shows you a short bit of a peptide from just one um, knotted protein. There's nothing um, unusual or unique about the sequence or the side chains or their order. But what I wanted to do was really highlight the structure um, because we all tend to represent uh, the protein chain as I've shown in C. So we tend to show them as smooth, smooth and uh, actually quite narrow chains or sometimes as ribbons, as you'll go on and see. And at least for some of the properties of um, protein knots, it's really important to be aware that when we're, when we're considering um, a knot in a protein chain, the polypeptide chain itself is not smooth. It has large side chains attached to it. Um, and so therefore, there can be friction between those side chains. OK, right. So. The linear, the linear chain comes to, can come together in a multitude of different ways. Um, and with all, almost all proteins, they form regular elements of what we call um, secondary structures, such as an alpha helix, which I'm showing in the, in, with the cursor here. So we have proteins such as globins, which have all helical structures. And we also have um, elements of secondary structure, which are the chain is in an extended conformation, and they form what we call beta strands, which come together to form beta sheets. And uh, again, just showing you an example here with an, what we call an immunoglobulin fold, which you find in antibodies. And this just shows you 10 different structures that protein chains can adopt. There are literally hundreds of different uh, ways in which the elements of secondary structure can come together and pack together to form 
a stable overall um, tertiary structure. So, okay, so just a tiny bit about proteins. Now I'm just going to um, take a few minutes and just talk through uh, a brief history of knots in proteins. And um, uh, I have to thank a few colleagues in the field because I used to start this story at 19, in 1994. Uh, and in fact, a few people corrected me, and, uh, and so now my story starts in 1974. So um, there was a paper in Nature by Brian um, Watson and Wendell. They solved the structure of this protein, yeast phosphoglycerate kinase. Um, the structure is shown here. Uh, the structure isn't important at all. The structure is beautiful, but not important for this talk. It doesn't contain a knot. But in this paper, uh, they make a reference to the possibility of a protein chain being knotted. And um, they say something which at the time was completely and utterly um, not controversial, which is knots in the polypeptide chain would not be expected to rise during spontaneous folding of the protein. And it was a bit of a throwaway line in, uh, in the paper, which was really all about this structure. Um, but it's very good because it illustrates um, what was pretty much um, assumed at the time, and that's that there weren't any proteins which would contain a knot. So if we go a few years on, a very famous uh, female, I have to say this because, of course, it's, it's International Women's Day today, Jane Richardson published a paper in 1977. She was a structural biologist, and she began to look at the different ways in which beta strands could come together, so how the chain um, could, could fold to form beta sheets with different um, overall structures. Um, and in doing so, she came up with, she looked through all the possible structures that have been found to exist, which includes these. She also considered lots of other theoretically possible structures. And um, there are a number of structures in which you can pack beta strands together to make beta sheets, which would uh, would actually make a knot. But again, th this is a slightly, uh, this is a very short paragraph in the paper, uh, which is just entitled The Absence of Knots. Uh, and here she just says that there are no knotted topologies within these type of beta sheet structures. Okay. Um, and but she goes on to note that the backbone of carbonic anhydrase does contain a knot, um, but it's not part of the beta sheet. Um, and she also notes that presumably a knot is not impossible if the piece to be tucked through the loop is very close to the chain end. Um, and again, she refers to the earlier paper, it would be exceedingly difficult for a protein to fold up into a knotted configuration. So again, totally um, not controversial at all. And then we go quite a few years forward to 1994, which, where, which is where my story used to begin, um, before someone told me about the um, uh, the other the other two papers. Okay, so in 1994, it there were actually quite a few protein structures in what we call the protein data bank, the PDB. So this is the database where all protein structures reside. And if you solve a structure, you deposit the coordinates to the data bank. And at this point, um, Mark Mansfield had another look. At this point, there were 400 structures, and that was quite considerably more than there had been in the late 70s. And essentially, he didn't find any. He found carbonic anhydrase B. It has a very shallow knot. Um, but basically, he didn't find anything else. And 
he concluded, shown in red, that the most reasonable interpretation of these results is that the protein folding mechanism only explores unknotted conformations. Now, this paper came out when I was a postdoc. I was interested in protein folding. I actually don't remember paying any attention to it whatsoever, partly because it was so obvious to me that there would not be any knots in proteins. So then we leap forward um, to 2000, and um, a computational structural biologist in London, Willie Taylor, um, was simulating, um, he was involved in um, protein structure prediction. And he would have lots of simulations going of, of protein chains folding, and in some cases, his chains formed knots. And he could visibly, in some cases, see the knots. And um, in those cases, he ended throwing out the results of those simulations because uh, they were clearly incorrect because, as everybody knew, there were, there were no knots in, in protein structures because that just wasn't compatible with protein folding mechanisms. Okay. So Willie got fed up of, um, of manually uh, detecting structures with knots. Um, and so he wrote an algorithm uh, which would detect whether a protein chain was knotted or not. And um, uh, this is the paper also in, in Nature. Um, and he uses a basic chain smoothing algorithm. There are now quite a few um, different ways um, of determining whether a protein chain is knotted or not. I perhaps should just point out at this point um, that protein chains have an N terminus and a C terminus. So this is where they start. This is where they finish. So there's a directionality of the chain. Um, and they are open chains. So in general, uh, the N and the C termini um, are not linked in any way. So one of the issues with um, determining whether a protein chain is uh, truly knotted or not is people have come up with different ways of um, essentially linking the N and the C termini, which are almost always on the outside of protein structures, not within the core, um, in order to then have a closed system in which you can rigorously determine whether it's knotted or not. I will go on to say that I don't think there's, with all of the protein structures that I'm referring to today, I don't think there's any issue about whether they are knotted or not. They, um, uh, they, 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 they're, they're all knotted. Anyway, back to Willie Taylor. So Willie Taylor wrote an algorithm which would take a um, protein structure, determine whether it had a knot in it, and uh, therefore he could just filter his um, structure prediction simulations and throw out all the incorrect um, structures which had knots in them. So, but he did a control. And his control was to run every structure in the protein data bank into his program. And his control was supposed to come out with zero hits apart from carbonic anhydrase. <laughs> and strangely enough, uh, uh, it hit a large number of proteins, which no one had um, detected were knotted. And it included proteins now which had very deep knots. So a large part of the protein chain passes through the knotting loop in order to form the knot. And this is just one example from his, uh, from his Nature paper. And after this, I think Willie Taylor got invited to just about every single knotting conference, protein knotting, um, that was going. Um, and I remember him once saying that actually what he didn't, what he really wanted to do was get back to protein structure prediction. And he still didn't really care so much about the knots, but he really started the field, I think.
Okay, so where are we now? So um, in 2015, Johannes Olkowska in Warsaw um, developed a lovely database called P Not Prot database, and and I've given you the link here. And it contains all the structures that have knots. If you've got a new protein structure, you can run it through their knotting algorithm to detect whether it's knotted or not. Um, and you can do lots of other things um, on the database. Essentially, um, uh, this is a slightly old slide. It only goes up to 2015. So hopefully you can see that the number of knotted proteins, it's rather faint here, has increased considerably in recent years, as has slip knotted proteins. And um, uh, I went and looked at the uh, database this morning just to update this. So there are now a total number of knotted protein chains is uh, 1740 and knotted chains um, 649. And uh, remarkably, I think, is um, that there are 488 uh, knotted protein chains that are sitting in the database um, but have yet to be um, uh, published. Okay, so we now know that there are indeed quite a few knots. So I should make one other comment. So for those of us who never ever expected to see a knot in a protein chain, this number is very large. This number is actually very small compared to the number of unknotted protein chains in the protein data bank. So they're still relatively, um, they're relatively rare structures. It seems like pro um, nature has um, generally selected against having a knotted protein chain. Um, but there is a significant enough number for us to be, become very interested about um, how these proteins fold, how, uh, what properties these proteins have over unknotted variants. And before I go further and talk just about knotted proteins, I wanted to show this slide. And this slide really is just to illustrate that we are now aware that there are a number of different topologically complex architectures in protein chains. So here uh, in E, we have a knotted protein. It's quite hard to see the knot. This is the rib, what we call the ribbon diagram showing uh, the backbone, the polypeptide backbone chain. This is a simplified um, version of this particular structure where you can easily see the knot. Um, there are slip knotted proteins, which are shown here, and they are also in Joanna's lovely database. Um, and I won't talk about them um, today. There are cysteine knotted proteins where the knots come about because of covalent linkages between different parts of the protein chain. Um, and we have, uh, we have um, what are called lasso, pierced lasso um, structures <laughs> where there is a covalent link in the chain, uh, a loop, and then the, the chain comes back through the loop. And we also have other types of linked ring structures. Okay, so, um, there are four different classes of topologically um, knotted protein um, that we have discovered so far. Um, so I know from a mathematical perspective, these are relatively small and simple knots. Um, I still think of them as a protein folder. I st still think of them as having inherent uh, really significant topological complexity. Um, here we see there's a lot of there's quite a lot of different trefoil knots, three one knots that we're aware of. Some of which are bacterial methyl transferases. We have a number of four one knots, uh, and I'll talk briefly about these. We have more complex five two Gordian knots. Uh, again, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about these um, and. Uh, 
just one six one knot um, from a, um, an enzyme which is a dehalogenase. Um, we have yet to see any five uh, five one knotted proteins. And I'm just, before I take a break, I'm just going to introduce you to two of the proteins that, knotted proteins that my group has studied um, considerably, um, and that's the tre a trefoil knotted methyl transferases. So the structure is shown uh, on the left, and uh, it's actually, it doesn't really matter for the sake of this talk, but it's actually a dimer. There are two fold, knotted folded subunits that come together to form the dimer. And um, it's hard to see without the color coding, but essentially a knotting loop is shown in yellow. And then the blue region of the protein, which is the C-terminal helix, is the region of the protein chain that comes through the knotting loop to form the knot. And this is a deeply knotted protein, um, and um, there are some 40, 50 residues, amino acid residues, uh, which form part um, of this blue region, which have to pass through the loop. The other protein that we've studied, so I should say that this trefoil knotted protein, the ones that we look at are actually bacterial. And we've also studied in great detail a 5-2 knotted protein called a ubiquitin C-terminal hydrolase. It has um, a more complex knot, but in this case, the knot is quite shallow. So only a small region at the N-terminus and at the C-terminus pass through loops in order to form um, the knotted structure. And, um, Again, if you see the full structure, this doesn't even have side chains on, it's just the backbone. If you see the full structure, um, I think we can all understand why it was so difficult for anyone to um, see the knotted structure uh, before Willie came along with his um, algorithm. At that point, um, I will take a break and see if there are any questions. So if you have a question, please turn your mic on and ask away. Yes, I have a question. Uh, sorry, maybe I missed this. When you say that a protein is deeply knotted, when you say deeply, wh why is deeply? Oh, sorry, I should have defined myself. So the, the deepness of the knot corresponds to how much, if I go back to this slide, how much of the chain has to go through a knotting loop uh -huh. in order to form the knot. So if I truncated this chain here, where I'm showing with my, my cursor, it would probably be a sh what we would call a shallow knot, whereas actually quite a long bit of protein chain has to come through. So it's a deep, so we'd call it a deep knot. And occasionally I'm asked, what's the cutoff between a shallow knot and a deep knot? What number of residues? And I don't, it's, it's, um, I don't think there's a threshold. Um, but certainly with some proteins, you only have four or five <clears throat> residues here. And in other proteins, you can get hundreds <clears throat> of residues um, here. And personally, I think the... The problem of how these fold is, I think there's a big difference between shallow and deeply knotted protein structures. Um, and I, I'm not going to talk that much about folding today, um, but if anyone's interested, um, I, I'm always happy to answer an email or, or, or have a Skype discussion. Okay, any more questions? Okay, I think I will just go on, yeah? Yes, please. Okay, so it, in the next, so I, I, I'm mainly going to talk about why there might be knots in protein structures, but before I do that, I just want to, um, uh, maybe it's just a bit of terrible self-promotion, <laughs> um, uh, but I'm just going to cover, um, 
what I think we've learned about how knotted proteins fold over the last decade that we've been studying them. And um, this is really a very, very brief description of lots of work. So here on the left in figure A, we have what, my, what is known as a protein folding funnel. And the idea is that the protein in its denatured unfolded state would sit on the rim, somewhere on this rim. It would have high entropy, but low enthalpy. And it would fold down into a highly uh, specific, entropically unfavorable native folded structure down here. And I come from the protein folding world where we used to look um, back in the 90s, we looked a lot at uh, lots of small proteins with fairly simple um, structures. And we got reasonable, um, we got, well, we got pretty strong evidence that actually folding in these cases is relatively simple and fast. And if you like, you can view it that the, pr the protein chain just kind of, if you like, f um, just travels down this um, folding funnel to the native state. So the one thing I can tell you after uh, more than a decade of working on the folding pathways of knotted proteins is their pathways, like their structures, are complex. There's multiple pathways. There's not just a single pathway to go down to get to the folded state. And there are many intermediate states along the way. So the energy landscape looks much more like uh, I've shown in figure B, where we will again start off somewhere up here in an unfolded or denatured state. And we may have different routes and we may come down. We may get stuck in local minima and have to come up out of them and go over barriers in order to get to the final knotted native state. Okay. So I'll also say that their folding, and so we, we've measured their, their folding rates experimentally and computationally, and their folding can be slow compared to many other proteins. And we have now shown for a number of systems that either the knotting step or, or some step closely linked to it can be the rate, rate limiting in the overall folding of these proteins. Now, I've put the word can in here because the diff we've now estimated how uh, much slower knotted proteins fold compared to unknotted proteins. And these are estimates. And generally, anywhere between a factor of two to a factor of 100. And that depends critically on the depth of the knot. So the ones which only are slower by a factor of, one, um, factor of two are the ones with the shallow knots. And the ones with very, very deep knots um, their folding is, 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 is considerably slower. And um, you don't need to understand this data, but I find it very hard to just put, um, uh, put conclusions up without showing some data. This is the folding of one of our methyl, uh, tree fill knotted methyl transferases. So you should just see the time scale. Lots of proteins fold on the time scale of seconds. Here we have many minutes. This is the protein being made by a cell. This is the protein folding in, in um, well, it's not quite a cell, but this is the protein being synthesized. This is it reaching its, its uh, native knotted state. And you can see there is a lag of 10, 20 minutes. So in this particular case, this is a deeply knotted protein, and it does fold slowly. We also. Um, have now found in, um, and also engineered <clears throat> proteins which can have very, very deep knots indeed. So this is actually the secondary structure of our uh, trefoil knotted methyl transferase. And we have engineered this protein. So we have an extension and a very, very stable um, 
stable uh, domain from another protein called Thi S attached to either its N terminus or attached to its C terminus or attached to two Thi S domains attached to both N and C terminus. And in this case, we go from a protein, and this just shows you some of the structures that we have for them. And essentially, in this case, we've extended the C terminus by some 90 amino acid residues. So we've increased the depth of this knot from about 40 to about 130. So this is just really to emphasize that we can, we can both now engineer and we can find very, very deeply knotted um, protein structures. And very somewhat strangely uh, and controversially for a while, we took our deeply knotted protein. This is our deeply knotted uh, methyl transferase. And this shows its folded state. And we unfolded it in just by using standard chemical denaturants and very standard techniques. So there is a knot in here. We lose all this structure, all the regular elements of secondary structure, the helices, the beta strands. And essentially, the chain itself unfolds. So it, the chain has no structure. Um, in terms of either secondary or tertiary structure, um, and we and it, um, and we at least to begin with, we of course retain the knot in the chain. Now we thought that this the, the knot without the structure would essentially this would very rapidly untie, and we would get an unfolded, denatured, and unknotted state. Um, which looked like this and had lost the knot. And remarkably, we found, and this other people have now found it too, that actually the knot in these structures is very kinetically stable. So you can unfold this structure here. You can unfold it over the course of, you know, 10, 20 seconds. The knot doesn't untie and disappear for months, which was um, a very unusual result. And again, I want to, I, the, one of the reasons why I wanted to mention at the beginning that proteins aren't really these smooth chains that we draw is because you have to consider the friction that the side chains um, create within uh, the knotted structure within the unfolded state, which we think keeps it, um, we it keeps it in this knotted state for some time. And we also know, and this I think is quite important for later on. We also know, so this, these are the results on our knotted methyl transferase, and this is it folding very slowly. So it's the same data I just showed you. And now in this experiment, what we did was we put in this large protein um, complex over here, which is called GROEL GROES. It's a protein that's very abundant uh, in bacterial cells, and it's called a chaperone. Um, and this type of protein has got the name chaperone because it aids in the folding of proteins in the cell. And amazingly, this putting in this um, cellular factor and ATP uh, speeds up um, the rate of folding of this knotted protein by orders of magnitude. So now this shows you here the, da the data we got with, with the chaperone in place. And this data show that um, now uh, it's folded um, very rapidly uh, after its synthesis, such that we can't see there's no lag at all. So we know in vivo that there are factors that speed up the folding of knotted proteins. OK, so now I'm going to um, get to um, address the title of the talk, which is why 
are there knots in proteins? And um, over the last couple of decades, uh, after they were first observed by Willie Taylor, um, a number of people came up with a number of different suggestions. Oh, sorry. So I should say, whoops, you can tell I've, <laughs> this is a new talk. I'm not quite sure what slide follows what. Okay, uh, sh so I should say that um, a number of groups have looked at the conservation of knots in protein structures. So one of the things we might not have so many protein structures of knotted proteins, but we have huge amounts of um, uh, genetic information where we can build up what are called phylogenetic trees, which can basically map the evolution of um, a protein structure. And um, uh, Christian is online, I think, so he knows much more about this than I do. Essentially, what they showed was, first of all, that you could uh, generate knotted protein structures from unknotted ones by um, the insertion of what's called a knot promoting loop. Um, so you can evolve a knotted protein structure from an unknotted one. And they also showed that once once they have formed a knotted structure, that knotted structure is retained. And this was revisited a couple of years later. Um, and uh, again, they looked at all the available protein structures. Um, and uh, essentially, they found that there was a strict conservation of the knotting patterns between different protein families which had quite different sequences. And essentially, this, this suggested that these knotted protein structures have been conserved by nature. So um, in the paper by uh, Ioanna Solkowska and colleagues, they concluded that because protein folding pathways leading to knotted protein structures are slower and less efficient, than those leading to unknotted proteins with similar size and sequence. This conservation suggests that there are important physiological roles of knots and slip knots in proteins. And that's, so this, this in fact, people were talking about why there are knots in proteins before this, um, but this came, um, this kind of just, if you like, really um, brought home the fact that these structures uh, have been conserved by nature. Now, I'll come back to this statement that folding pathways are slower and less efficient later, because some of them are, but some of them are not. And particularly in vivo with the presence of molecular chaperones, um, it's very, very likely that actually the folding pathways are no slower and no less efficient um, than many other unknotted proteins. Okay, so what, what ideas did people come up with um, about why there were knots in proteins and how the properties of knotted protein structures differed from unknotted ones? So essentially, there's five different, um, five different theories, one of which is they stabilize the thermodynamic stability of the native state. And I'll explain in detail what all these things are in the following slides. So maybe they stabilize thermodynamic stability, or maybe they stabilize kinetic stability, or maybe they stabilize mechanical stability, or maybe these knotted proteins are harder for cells to degrade, i.e. that increases their cellular stability. So all of these are kind of linked to st different definitions of stability. Also, a suggestion that they stabilize the catalytic region of knotted enzymes. So I should say that not all knotted proteins are enzymes. Um, and I won't talk about this here because I don't really have time. But I'm just going to go through the evidence for and against one, two, three, and four. Uh, and I will say that this is in part due to the fact that I keep reading that not stabilized proteins and 
I'm not totally convinced, <laughs> as you will see, I think, from, uh, from the rest of my talk. So, first of all, not stabilize the thermodynamic stability of the native states of proteins. What do we mean by that, and what's our definition of thermodynamic stability? So, this is a simple free energy diagram where we have the unfolded or denatured state here. We have some energy barrier to folding. We go over to the native folded state over here, and our thermodynamic stability is simply the difference in energy here. This is what we call a two-state system, because there are just two states populated. Okay, this is a very simple case. This is the only definition of thermodynamic stability you can get. If we go to more complicated systems where there's an intermediate state between the denatured state and the native state, then we have two different thermodynamic parameters. This one here, which is between the intermediate state and the native state, and then this one here between the denatured state and the native state, or this one between D and I. So I am going to argue that the only um, thermodynamic free energy barrier that makes any difference to nature is this one here. Okay? And that's because only the native state is active and functional in vivo. Intermediate states, none of them uh, are active. None of, them do, none of them carry out their biological function. So this is the key energy barrier that we're, sorry, this is the key difference in energy that we should care about. If we go to our knotted proteins, things get even more complex because we've, we've got, you know, a denatured state which might be knotted in equilibrium with a denatured state where it be unknotted. We have a much more complex free energy diagram. I still go back to the same point. The only energy difference we should be considering is this energy difference here between the native knotted state, which is functional, and an intermediate state which may be knotted, it may be unknotted. Actually, it must be knotted in this free energy diagram. Um, but it won't, ha won't have any biological function. So this is the particular um, uh, difference in energy we are interested in. And I'll also just briefly mention that in order to measure this value here accurately, we need a system which we say is fully reversible. We need to be able to go from our native knotted state to a denatured state and from a denatured state back to our native knotted state in order, um, in order uh, to get reliable thermodynamic um, values for this free energy difference. And if we have aggregation in which multiple protein chains uh, self-associate uh, into some kind of um, large aggregated species, then we cannot, we cannot measure this. Okay, so this now, this table now tries to summarize a lot of data. It, this is just all experimental data. These are the knots which people have um, characterized experimentally. These are different free energy differences. Um, and they, there are lots of numbers. These are uh, in kilocals per mole. And um, the only thing I want you to really um, uh, take home message is all these values are, it, are within the values measured for the free energy changes measured for many other proteins which can be as small as 1.5 kilocals per mole or as high as 25 kilocals per mole. So there's nothing in this set of numbers which suggests that they're particularly thermodynamically stable. And the other point to make is that you can take one protein, it might have 200 amino acids in its chain, and you might make one mutation. So you might change one amino acid residue to another, uh, you you uh, will probably not change the structure, and if it has a knot, you will not change whether it is knotted or not. 
that you can significantly change the thermodynamic stability of the system by four to five kilocals per mole. And I think that's important um, also to remember for a number of different um, interpretation of a number of different studies. So I am, oh, I think I went backwards. Um, so I haven't put in, I've just given the experimental data, but I can tell you that the computational data, there isn't any strong computational data that knots affect the thermodynamic stability of proteins. So let's go on to the next um, suggestion that knots stabilize the kinetic stability of proteins. And again, I'm just going to start off by defining the kinetic stability. So if we go back to our free energy diagram, we have an energy barrier represented here between our native state and our transition state. And this energy barrier here directly relates to the rate of unfolding. So the higher the energy barrier, the slower the unfolding. This is for a two-state system. This is for a three-state system. Again, it's just the same. The key energy barrier is this energy barrier here between the native state and what I'm calling transition state one, because this state is, uh, is, is again, not active. And again, with with knotted proteins, we can create a more complicated free energy diagram because we may go from the, un, the native knotted state to an intermediate state to a knotted denatured state to a non-knotted denatured state, but it doesn't matter. The only important energy barrier that we really want to consider when we're thinking about kinetic stability is this energy barrier here. So, is there any evidence from experimental or computational studies that knots increase the uh, sorry decrease the rate of unfolding i.e they make the protein kinetically more stable here are all the unfolding rates extrapolated to water that have been measured experimentally you can see that there is a vast range in different rates. I think we have seven, at least seven orders of magnitude here. And if we just compare them globally to the unfolding rate constants for unknotted proteins, then actually they vary widely to anything from three times 10 to the minus 10 per second for GFP to 1.3 per second. So there's nothing special about these unfolding rates. What we haven't yet done is really compare unfolding rates of, of these knotted proteins with, with unknotted variants which have similar structures. Okay, computational studies, there actually is a little bit of evidence that, well, there is some evidence that knots reduce the rate of unfolding. And this has come from um, two papers, um, um, initially um, from, um, uh, by Joanna Solkowska and Marek Chiplak. Okay, so there is some evidence from computational studies that maybe uh, knots affect the, the, the kinetic um, unfolding rate. Okay, so let's look at the third one, knots increase the mechanical stability of proteins. And what I mean by that is large forces are needed to unfold knotted proteins. I'm going to very quickly talk through the experiment, which you can either do with an AFM instrument or an optical tweezer. But if you look here on the right, this, tel this, this um, tells you how we do this experiment. So we take the protein we're interested in, we put on some DNA handles. So these are just chemically attached to the N and the C termini of our protein. And those uh, DNA handles are attached to beads, which are located and can be moved within an optical trap, which is shown here. And then we can either stretch the distance, we can stretch the system, so we can effectively put force on here, pull this out, or we can relax the system back down. Um, so we have now done this for uh, quite a few proteins. Uh, I've just summarized the data here. 
the first example was a 4-1 knotted phytochrome shown here. This just shows you um, uh, the, the, the force and the unfolding that, 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 that happens. I won't explain in detail how this works. The key thing is, is you require about 47 piconewtons to unfold this protein. If you pull from the N termini and the C termini, because it's knotted, you end up with a tightened knot somewhere in the chain. And from the experimental data, you can calculate how many amino acid residues are associated with that tightened knot. In this case, it's about 17. So we'll come back to this figure 47. Uh, the next study was um, done in uh, the group of Lee in um, uh, Vancouver. And he took a slip knotted protein shown here, but he pulled it in a direction such, he pulled it at positions and in a direction such that he created a tightened 3-1 knot. So if you pulled from N and C termini, the slip knot would undo. They pulled from other positions, not the termini. This took a large force to unfold it. And again, they could calculate the, the amount, of, um, uh, amount of the protein chain within the tightened knot. This is a trefoil knot now, so it's a smaller knot. And a corresponding smaller amount of uh, the protein chain is tightened in that knot. And we did, um, we published relatively recently on um, a 5 2 knotted protein. We actually pulled from different positions at the N and the C termini to make a 5 2 knot. We pulled at other positions where we unknotted it and at other positions where we made a 3 1 knot. And essentially, these are the different forces. So this one, 40 piconewtons. Next one, 18 piconewtons. And this one, 40 piconewtons. And uh, again, the only inter the interesting thing here is we can again estimate the size of a 5-2 knot. And I won't go into these two different numbers. But essentially, these are actually relatively slow, relatively low forces. So the only one that shows high forces needed is the slip knot. And this just shows you some of the forces that are required for unknotted proteins. So um, uh, maltose binding protein up to 50 piconewtons, Ig domains of titan up to 200 piconewtons, GFP, which is not a knotted protein, 600 piconewtons. So um, at least experimentally, the forces required are completely comparable with those that we find for unknotted proteins. Again, computational studies, actually there is some evidence that knots can confer mechanical stability. Um, and maybe knotting can confer mechanical stability on the native states of proteins, but knotted proteins are not particularly mechanically stable. Now, I can see DeWitt looking at his watch. So do you want me to speed up? Oh, I can't hear you. Can you switch your microphone on? I say keep going. You're doing very well. OK, great. Right. So I'm actually on the last bit anyway. So this idea that knotted proteins are hard or impossible for cells to degrade which would lead to an increased stability in vivo. So I'm sorry, I have to introduce some biology. And that's to tell you that within our cells, we have um, large and efficient degradation machines. Um, and this is the machine shown here. This is the machine from bacteria. It's called CLIP-XP, because it's got um, a part here in red and a part here in green, which are clip X and clip P. Essentially, what happens is we have a folded protein, and it has what's called a degron, but you can just think it's just a tag. The machinery recognizes the tag and grabs it. This red domain, through rounds of ATP binding and hydrolysis, then unfolds the protein, which is shown here, okay? 
that, and what happens, and as well as unfolding it, it translocates the chain through the barrel. So there's a central pore running through the center of this machine. And the polypeptide chain goes through this pore and it gets chopped up down here in the green domain. And um, this is a bacterial system. Um, humans have a very similar uh, but not identical system called the proteasome. Okay, so, um, so the idea is that if you have a protein which has a knot in it, it can't even get into the pore uh, to, to go through the machinery to be um, degraded. So the idea was that, that, that this might be um, one of their um, significant properties. Okay, so there are now three published studies looking at this. The first was published a couple of years ago um, by the Bustamante group and the Bayer's group in Chile. Bustamante is in um, California. And um, just to just very quickly to go through this story, they took a shallow trefoil knotted protein, and this just shows you protein at the start. And you basically, you can just see protein disappearing. So this protein is being rapidly degraded. So this has a shallow trefoil knot. This is the knotted protein here. What happens if we have, so this, this, this trefoil protein rapidly degraded by this degradation machine. If we put a big stable protein on the end of the chain, this is green fluorescent protein, put a little linker and then the knotted protein and then pull it through the knot, through, sorry, through the translic, uh, through the degradation machine, then, we, sorry, this is a bit messy and you don't really need to understand it, but essentially what you get is you get it partially degraded and then everything stops. Um, and you get what are called degradation intermediates. And they published, um, they published a paper which says knots can impair the protein degradation um, by clip PX. So not on their own, but maybe when they're fused to something else, protein knots can affect the degradation machine. Okay. Last year, another paper came out where they'd looked at a, a more complicated protein knot. So this is the 5-2 Gordian knot I introduced earlier, which my group has also looked at in a, a great amount of detail. So its Titan knot is much bigger. So maybe this, this is um, difficult for the CLIP-XP system to digest. Okay. This just shows you, well, you can see it up here. This is a protein at time zero. And there's still an awful lot of protein after 400 minutes. So this looks like actually this particular knotted protein is incredibly difficult for the degradation machine um, to degrade. Interestingly, UCHL5, another knotted protein, you see a bit of degradation. And UCHL3, uh, actually another knotted protein, they've all got the same type of knot then considerable degradation. So is it the knot that makes this uh, particular 5-2 knotted protein so resistant to degradation, or is it something else? So um, yeah, so we have just published our study. We looked at both a trefoil knot and a 5-2 knot. Just as with the bustamante Byers study, we saw rapid degradation of the trefoil knot on its own. And we put a different block on the end. We put our, our protein thigh S. Um, and we also saw degradation intermediates. And I'm not going to talk about whether they're important or not here. But just without, without the, 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 um, without the uh, fused domain onto it, this is degraded rapidly. We also looked at the 5-2 knotted protein, and our first result was exactly the same as the previous study by the SHU group. We saw that for UCHL1, actually, we saw almost no degradation at all. Now, I should say you can put the tag either at, at either end of the protein, at the C terminus or the N terminus. It's easier to put it at the C terminus. So the shoe, the shoe study, um, 
just put it at the C terminus and found that it wasn't degraded. So we actually put it at both termini. And remarkably, we argued, well, if it's the knot that's uh, making it very hard to degrade, then the knot's still there, whether you put the tag at the end terminus or the C terminus. But if you put it at the end terminus, it's rapidly degraded. So there's something about the C terminus uh, that makes it particularly hard um, uh, for the degradation machine to degrade this particular protein. Um, and uh, again, I, I, I won't, so, so we did something which is basically we made a few mutations which drastically destabilize the C-terminal region of structure. These proteins are still knotted, but the st their local stability at the C-terminus is um, is greatly reduced, and now in these cases, oh, there's my cursor gone. In these cases, if we put the tag at the C terminus, where we had no degradation, now we get rapid degradation. So we know that it's that this reason why it's not degraded is nothing to do with the knot. It's simply to do with the local stability around the point at which you attach the the, the tag. Okay, and just to try and be complete, so we have studies that, lots of studies now, which show that the bacterial degradation machines can degrade both 3-1 and 5-knotted proteins. The fusions, if you fuse the knotted proteins to a super stable domain, you get partial degradation, and you may think that's significant, but I just want to point out that if you um, fuse an unknotted protein to a super stable protein, you also get partial degradation. So this is not a consequence of the knot. This is almost certainly just a consequence of, of, of the fact that at the end of your chain, you've put a big, um, a big immovable block. And just to try and be complete, there are computations, one computational study that's looked at that. And they say that they do observe the fact that a knot hinders and sometimes jams the translocation. We're just doing more experiments at the moment to see if we ever see jamming. And I have, we can't look at a single molecule level, but we never see the degradation machine jam, even with 5-2 knotted proteins. So, so, um, those are my conclusions, and um, the simple answer, I think, to why uh, there are knots in proteins is simply we do not fully understand it yet. And I know that lots of people in the field um, want them to be uh, super stable for a whole variety of reasons, particularly in terms of generating um, knotted proteins with, with, with activities for therapeutic use and things. I think there's still lots to be resolved and lots more experimental computational studies needed before we really understand um, a, a lot of these things. I'm just going to finish by showing my acknowledgement slides. I am... Um, um, Unapologetically, I've highlighted in red all the women <laughs> involved in the in the project, um, just because it's it's International Women's Day, and um, I still think there are not enough women in science. So this is my this is my little um, little pitch. Um, okay, and um, thanks thanks everyone for listening. Well, Sophie, thank you very much. That was a terrific talk. So, how about some questions? Silence. <laughs> yeah. I have a little question. Um, I wanted to ask you, you, you talk about uh, the energy landscape at some point and how we can use this energy to, um, to, to study the way that the protein is folding. And uh, I just wanted to ask if anyone has um, tried to study this uh, surface with topological tools. Oh, it's, so are you talking about this slide here? Yes, yes. So yeah. I, I, I don't know. Do we have equation of this kind of surface? Uh, could someone no. study this with the tools or? So these these types of of energy landscapes have they've come um, 
They've come from the groups of Peter Woolliness and Jose Anuchik, who are now at Rice University in the States. Um, and, uh, and if you want to look it up, they call it the new view of protein folding. And they come from computational, they mainly come from computational studies or you know, theoretical studies. I mean, we certainly can experimentally, we can characterize the native state, we can characterize the denatured state, we can characterize very high energy barriers, and we can characterize uh, minima, uh, even if they're local minima. We can't experimentally, we, we, can't, um, we can't get a map of the entire energy landscape. I, so I'm not exactly sure what topological tools you may be considering. Well, well I, I don't know if, for instance, do we have an equation, um, a surface equation? Can we arrive to that or is, that, is this only numerical? Uh, no, so uh, yeah, no, no equations, unfortunately. No Just equations. numerical okay, yeah. and simulations, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, they, so just many of you will be from a computational background probably so you might be be interested that um i mean people have now simulated using all atom models the complete folding pathway of small proteins that kind of have rel have pretty smooth um energy landscapes and I am thinking in particularly of the work of David Shaw in New York, uh, and he simulated the pathway of the protein ubiquitin. So ubiquitin is 76 amino acids long, and it's got a simple structure. And that was a huge, huge, huge task. I think they published that study in Nature. Actually, computationally, knotted proteins are sufficiently complex and even in unknotted proteins if you go up in size of course the computational problem scales badly against you um, so computationally people looking uh, looking at the folding of knotted proteins either use coarse grained models um, but but they don't have equations and i mean essentially they can they can map structurally what's going on during their simulations but they are either can only run for short simulation times or they have to simplify the model in some way mm -hmm. right thank you very much for okay that. some other great questions answer. and and for the great talk actually thank you <laughs> Okay, how about some other questions? Ah, okay. Christian. Yes, I've got a question for Sophie. Beautiful talk, as usual. Thank you. So, uh, in the end, there are no simple answers to yes. the simplest questions that one can ask. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Or, or if, we, if we had an answer, then we just have come up with 10 more questions. Right, right. The, lots of food for thought. I, I wish to ask you about uh, the fact that all the um, knotted, all the knots that are currently seen in proteins belong to the twist knots family. So right. it has uh. been argued that, that that is because essentially the unknotting number of these twist knots is one, and so they're easy to unknot, which means when you fold, that's your favored to do with just one crossing to form those knots. Uh, on, at the same time, if you do simulations on uh, fully flexible chains, which of course is not a good model for proteins, but you, you would tend to have a substantial population, let's say, of five crossing knots, five one, for instance, compared to more complicated knots. So uh, among the twist knots, the simplest twist knot that is yet to be discovered in the protein realm would be a seven two, seven two uh, mm. knot. Uh, so, what do you think are the odds of uh, discovering the next more complex uh, twist knots as opposed uh, to the torus five crossing knot? You must have thought about it. I have. I my my gut feeling is that we are not going to find them in nature. Whether we can engineer them or not is a completely different question. And I think I'd have more money on us being able to engineer them at some point in the future 
than finding them in nature. I mean, I think there must be a point at which the the not the threading become things get kinetically trapped and misfolded and nature has selected against them. I mean, it's clear that nature has largely selected against knots, but just not completely. Um, and maybe it's just gone all out at selecting against twist knots. But I, I do think there's a possibility of us designing them. Um, and um, we haven't published it. I mean, we, we, we haven't thought about trying to design a 7 one of seven two, did you say seven one or seven anyway we haven't seven thought two. about des designing more complex knots but one of the things we do have is we have a protein chain that has two tree fall knots in and yes. we're pretty oh. confident that that folds and that that has the the two the two tree fall knots in um so it has to fo it has to form a knot twice which is not quite the same of course as it forming a more complex knot but I have got to the point in my career where it's, I quite like being proved wrong because <laughs> then, <laughs> then I can learn more. And um, so yeah, maybe, maybe, um, maybe there is, there are more complicated knots out there for us, protein knots out there for us to find. Thank you. Well, Sophie, about those uh, two trefoils, are they both sort of right-handed or both left-handed or? Does the chirality change from one to the other? Uh, no, we, we, I can't remember now whether it, they're either both left or both right, and I can't remember which. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, no, we just, we just duplicated the gene for a knotted protein and fused it together and just said, you know, it, it, it can't, the two, the two knotted domains will have the same structure, but they can't both fold from the same termini. So, yeah. Interesting. It's, 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 if you, some point, yeah. If you have a point mutation in a protein chain, is it going to change the fact that it's knotted in its uh, native state? No, it, I don't. If it folds, it's likely to be, it's very, very, very likely to be knotted. The, you're much more likely if you make a mutation just to find, just to have a protein that's too unstable to fold. If they fold, you can make mutations in hundreds of thousands of structures, and the mutations all fold pretty much to the same structure in 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, but what you do is you affect their stability. And at least for us, we actually think that measuring the activity of these, these knotted proteins that we've messed around with, we're, we're pretty confident that if we've made active mutants, that they have to be knotted. Because generally with proteins, if you, mess too much, if you mess around with the structure, you'll mess around with the function of the, of the protein. Okay. So I Any know not every, not everyone believes me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm confident of that. That's what I'll say. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? I have an elementary question and a comment, please. The elementary question, Sophie, is this one. When you talk about folding or unfolding, are you talking uh, about unfolding in topological terms, meaning there is no crossings in the arcs? No. So I use the terms unfolding and folding as I, uh, as they are used in a from a protein folding background. So when I talk about a protein unfolding, um, and I've tried to go back to this slide here. All of what we, we would think of as the native structure, so all the secondary structure, the helices, the beta strands here in the middle, um, and the way in which these are interacting and packing against each other to form a core of the protein, all that secondary structure and tertiary structure is lost. So when I talk about unfolding, I 
actually am not saying necessarily whether it is unknotting. So, so Sophie, in that picture, how can you tell that this middle state, the unfolded one, is still knotted? Oh, um, okay. So simply, if you uh, if you engineer the protein so that you put um, side chains on the ends that can make a covalent bond, you can make a closed system. And it's a bit hard okay. to see here, but actually the C terminus and the N -ter and the N terminus of the protein they look like they're a long way away, but they're actually not. So what we did was we unfolded the protein. We then chemically uh, closed the chain, and we simply then got rid of the chemical denaturant that's keeping it unfolded and asked the question, um, can it go back? If, it, if it's in this state and it's closed, if it's unknotted and it goes back, it can't go back because it can't form the knot because it's in the unknotted closed state. If it remains knotted um, and we close the system and we get rid of the chemical denaturant, it should be able to get back to the native functional state. And this is what we see. There's okay. also a lot of other evidence which is based on all the kinetic analysis that we did, which is a bit harder to explain, but this is all so this is in this PNAS paper in 2010. And this is where I had a bet with my research group. Um, we, we all had a bet on whether the denatured state would be knotted or whether it would be unknotted. And I said it would be unknotted. <laughs> so my students were extremely happy to come back to me and tell me I was wrong. <laughs> And once we'd made completely sure that the results were absolutely watertight, I was very happy that I was wrong because it was much more interesting. Excellent. Okay. Just Another one question. comment. One comment uh, about the energy landscape. Uh, I just. Uh, found a paper uh, maybe a year ago that is called Topology of Cyclo-Octane Energy Landscape, uh, publishing, okay. uh, publishing 2010 in the Journal of Chemical Physics. And what is interesting about the question that I think uh, Satis, uh, he did, it turns yes, out yes. that the that energy the energy landscape is topologically interesting, meaning okay. the, the, the paper says that the energy landscape of this uh, cyclo octane is, a compo is composed of the union of a sphere and a Klein bottle intersecting oh. in two rings. So oh, what's wonderful. happening is that if you say that for this kind of uh, cyclo obtain, then this becomes a topological interest in space. Right. That we have, by the way, I have to say that this is a little bit of publicity, but here in Mexico, we've been studying this structure of these topological structures that we call them to stratifolds. And this example in this paper of this energy landscape is one of these, uh, what we call two stratifolds. Hey, that, that, sounds, that sounds fascinating. Um, and I'll go and look at the cyclooctane paper. I have to admit, I'm, I'm not really an expert on energy landscapes. If you were interested in in whether there were energy landscapes that could be generated for knotted proteins the person you should ask is Joanna Solkowska in Poland so she's done a lot of the very nice um, computational work on on 
are not in proteins. And Christian, of course. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And thank you, okay. um, Luisa Carlos, for this, uh, for this paper. I will look at it. Thank you.